Okay, everybody, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today we're going to hear from Dr. Daniel GMR. Uh, he received his BS in Civil Engineering from Carnegie Mellon in 1996 and Master's in PhD in Environmental Engineering from Caltech in 1998 and 2001, respectively. In 2002, WashU was lucky enough to get him as a professor in the Energy, Environmental, and Chemical Engineering Department, where his work has focused on investigating chemical reactions involving heavy metals, radionuclides, and other contaminants in aquatic system. Today, we're going to hear about his recent work and some background on uh, the chemistry and engineering for producing and supplying clean drinking water. So, if we could welcome our speaker. Thank you very much, Caitlin, for that introduction. And um, really, thank you to all of you for coming out. Change our lighting here. Uh, on a Saturday morning, I know it's a busy time of year. Oh, he's, he's got him here. Great. Excellent. Um, so happy to see all of you coming out to hear maybe a little bit of science, a little bit of environmental engineering uh, on a Saturday. So to motivate this, I thought I'd put up a couple of pictures. Um, I do ask questions sometimes, so I may ask a few questions as we go along here to, to kind of warm up. So does anybody know where this is? You got these two little houses sitting in the middle of a river. If you live in the city of St. Louis, those are water intakes for the water treatment plant of the city of St. Louis. And you can see these from the Chain of Rocks Bridge. So that's where the water comes from. Starts out as the Missouri River, goes to the water treatment plant, you get nice clean water like this. If you're like me this morning, you're happy that we turn some of this into some of this. I think I even have the brand right there. And then of course, we then go from there back to a wastewater treatment plant, and then we put it back in the river. And so just to kind of illustrate that overall cycle that we would have. Very short introduction to my research group and kind of how we think about things. And then I'll really, I think, uh, go through examples on this a little bit more um, as we get into the talk. So our, as Caitlin said, our interest is heavy metals and natural and engineered aquatic systems. We're very interested in reactions with solid water interfaces. And so our basic tools are aquatic chemistry, solid phase characterization, and some modeling. This is a, uh, that rust colored beaker really is full of rust, and that's rust that we produce by electric coagulation to treat water. That is a lead carbonate particle that you might see. Actually, it's a lead oxide particle that was once a lead carbonate particle. I retain the shape of it that you might see on the inside of a lead pipe used to distribute drinking water. And then this is a little bit of modeling that we've done for the absorption of manganese onto a uh, absorption of uranium onto a manganese oxide. My research group, um, we organize our research group based on the periodic table. And right now we have people working on uranium, arsenic, chromium, um, and carbon. In the past, we've also had people looking at lead. So the uranium, the chromium, the lead, the arsenic, we're interested in them because they're trace elements, but they're toxic trace elements. We, can, uh, we care about their concentrations in drinking water because of their health effects. So our overall research portfolio, I'll be talking to you about these projects in here on water supply and treatment today. We also do work on the chemistry of environmental remediation and also work looking at the environmental impacts of fossil energy byproducts. Principally for us, what that means right now is geologic carbon sequestration. So that's the overall uh, work that we do in my research group, which I should mention is uh, done right up on the first floor of uh, Brower Hall where we have our laboratory. Uh, but today I'll be talking drinking water. So now to put this in context, because St. Louis is a great place to talk about drinking water because we are right there at the confluence of a couple of major rivers. And so if you conclude the Missouri River watershed, the upper Mississippi River watershed, roughly a sixth of the area of the lower 48 drains past St. Louis here at the Arch. So we have an abundance of water. So we are not usually worried about availability of water in St. Louis. We are concerned about water quality because, of course, our water is coming from all these areas here and all the things that people do there can affect the water quality that reaches us here in St. Louis. So I'll start out with a satellite image of St. Louis. You're right there at point A. That is us. There are a couple, actually I would say a few, if you will, large rivers that you can see on here. So of course you can see the Mississippi coming down through here. That one right there is the Missouri River. And then I say a few because it's not just a couple, because the Illinois River actually contributes significant water to the upper Mississippi and comes in right there. 
So if you've been up to Pere Marquette State Park, right up there, nice area to go. So St. Louis, we're sitting here really at the confluence of a lot of, of surface water. So I'm going to put the blue dots up here. They're in the right places. Yeah. The blue dots are where we get our water. Um, for drinking water supply, you're either going to get your water from groundwater, which means you build a well, or you're going to get it from the surface water. If you're in St. Louis with this abundance of surface water from the regional river, you get our water from surface water. The place where you saw those little houses in the river, that's the Chain of Rocks water treatment plant up there. The city and the county have water treatment plants out here, and then the county also has one up there, as well as one down there on the Merrimack River. So a couple of uh, drinking water treatment plants, and then I'm going to put up the brown dots. So you can guess what the brown dots are. Those are where we send our wastewater. So after we've used the water, it comes to St. Louis. For us, it comes comes probably a little bit from here and a little bit from here, comes to us here. We use it, it goes into a sewer system, goes down to wastewater treatment plants down here, some up here. For the most part, we have, as St. Louis, done a good job of trying to put our wastewater treatment plants downstream of our water treatment plants. Okay. Kind of makes sense. So we get clean water in, send it back to the dirty water there, dirty water there, more of it downstream. And so that's to keep our source water as good as we can. But of course, um, as I mentioned, we have all of these areas upstream of us that would be contributing their wastewater, their agricultural runoff, to our water supply. So we are going to have to think about that. Uh, to put this in some context, um, I'll talk about a different city right now, which is the city of Chicago. And Chicago, as you probably know, sits right on the shores of Lake Michigan. And historically, they would get their drinking water from Lake Michigan. Big fresh water body there, you need drinking water, that's where you'll get it. Well, where did they put their wastewater? Lake Michigan. Okay. So it would be taking your water out, making it dirty, putting it back in, taking it out. This worked for a little while, but as Chicago grew in size and population, that was not sustainable. They couldn't have the same place to put their wastewater that was their drinking water supply. People were getting sick from this. And so they solved the problem by reversing the flow of the Chicago River, which naturally should flow from the area of Chicago into Lake Michigan. There's a dam there now, and the Chicago River now flows backward, goes through a canal, into the Des Plaines River, into the Illinois River, and into the Mississippi River coming to St. Louis. So in terms of the great Chicago-St. Louis rivalry, which was baseball, but it was also kind of mid-continent prominence in terms of a rivalry in the late 19th century, early 20th century, that was really a, an offensive thing for Chicago to do. Send their wastewater down to us in St. Louis. And they did this in 1900. Okay? What happened in St. Louis in 1904? World's Fair. Okay, So four years before we're going to host the World's Fair, Chicago says, here is our wastewater. Have at it. Host the World's Fair. So we did. We did that by upgrading some major water treatment facilities. That's the Chain of Rocks facility there. You can see these very large settling basins. That's to let the particles settle out. They implemented lime softening, excess lime, which was very good at getting particles out. It was also actually quite good at disinfecting the water. That wasn't the main goal, uh, but it, it did disinfect the water, made the water clear. And so before the 1904 World's Fair, we had the muddy Mississippi with contributions of Chicago wastewater, crystal clear, Good tasting, healthy, safe water in 1904. Major environmental engineering achievement and major, really, civic achievement for the city. So, to go through just a little bit more uh, historical context for this before I'll get into some of our, our own research, um, this is the benefits of drinking water treatment. So, these are typhoid cases per 100,000 population. Typhoid is a waterborne disease, cholera is also a waterborne disease. Cities like Philadelphia and St. Louis were plagued by cholera and typhoid epidemics through the 19th century. These are the cases. We put in slow sand filtration in 1906 in Philadelphia. Uh, St. Louis was about the same time those were put in. Chlorination also about the same time in Philadelphia and St. Louis around 1913 or so. And you can see typhoid just went away. Engineering solutions were public health problems. Uh, it got some awards, if you will. Um, around, uh, I think, about the turn of the millennium, the National Academy of Engineering, that's the NAE, put out their list of the top 20 uh, century engineering achievements. Number four on the list was safe drinking water. 
more important than the radio and television, more important than computers, the telephone, and air conditioning, not as important as electricity, the automobile, and airplane, but uh, pretty important stuff. So how do we treat our water? I'll step through a couple of things here and really try to get into the chemistry of it. Uh, this is uh, a nice uh, graphic that I was able to pull off the web. St. Louis, I need to call them and tell them to make a nice graphic for this system so we can have it exactly. If you've got a surface water, screening, take out baseball bat, baseball, large fish, tires, you name it, in the river. Goes into coagulation, which means making small particles want to stick together. Small particles that have aggregated together will settle out of the water a lot more easily than well dispersed small particles. We have coagulation, we would go into sedimentation, everything's going to fall out there. Add some chlorine, we go through uh, filtration. Filtration isn't like a coffee filter, the way you would think often about filters. It's not a filter membrane, uh, at least for most systems. It is a bed of sand that's about as tall as I am. You'd have a bed of sand in gravel and you pass the water through that. So as the water goes through, the small particles collide with the sand particles and get removed. So that's how filtration works in a water treatment plant. You'll add some chemicals on the way, some chlorine, maybe some orthophosphate. That'll become important here in a second. And then we distribute it out to all of you. Yeah? I thought it was a little thing, but it's like a cold. Yeah. 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 So you'd possibly put anthracite there. In St. Louis, we actually have a, multi, a single media filter. It's usually just sand, but some of you will have some anthracite, which has a benefit of also chemically filtering the water by absorbing uh, contaminants the way you would have, as you said, like charcoal in your fish tank. System. Absolutely. So one of the things that we need to do in St. Louis is to soften the water. These are water qualities for a couple of different supplies. There's St. Louis. The blue bar is the hardness. The hardness is the sum of the dissolved magnesium and calcium. The alkalinity is in red, and then that's organic matter. If you're in Boston on the East Coast or someplace, uh, you have very soft water. And if you're like me, and I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, uh, we had hard water. Hard water, um, it will precipitate on your kettles, on your bathtubs, that's a problem, but it precipitates soaps. So it's hard to get up a good lather of soap with really hard water. The flip side is it's hard to get the soap off of you with really soft water. So if you're like me and then you went to the East Coast, you would uh, you never felt that you got the soap off because that's, there wasn't enough hardness in the water. Well, in St. Louis, our water was too hard, so we had to soften it. And we do that by precipitating out calcium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide. So we adjust the chemistry at the water treatment plant to make the calcium go from a dissolved species into a precipitate, the magnesium go from a dissolved species into a precipitate. And we would rather that happen in the water treatment plant rather than inside of somebody's pipe or on somebody's uh, you know, water fountain. And so that would be line scale. That's when these deposits form when we haven't removed the hardness. So Missouri River has a hardness of 190 milligrams per liter and a pH of 8.2. CH is going to be very important uh, for a lot of what, what we do in my group and a decent amount of what we'll talk about here. So you're probably aware that perfectly neutral water is pH 7. Just for context, orange juice is about pH 4. And milk is maybe also about pH 7, 7.5. Coca-Cola, don't drink it, it's pH 2.5. Fortunately, it has some phosphate in it, so it would dissolve your teeth, but the phosphate actually helps to pre prevent that a little bit. Uh, just to give you some sense, so pH 7 is perfectly neutral. So the Missouri River has a pH of about 8 to 8.2, and that's because we have all of the limestone in this area with the same stuff that's giving us the hardness, it's giving us some nice alkalinity of the water. pH 8 is a beautiful pH for a water. It's about also the pH of the ocean. So what do we do in St. Louis? Does anybody know the pH of St. Louis tap water? Hazard a guess, is it? Higher than 8.2, lower than 8.2? We'll just do a quick vote. Who thinks it's higher than 8.2? Who thinks it's lower? All right. Well, in order to precipitate out the calcium as calcium carbonate and the magnesium as magnesium hydroxide, we had to increase the pH because we wanted a hydroxide. And we have more hydroxide at high pH. So at the water treatment plant, the pH might come up to 10 or 11. And they don't even worry about bringing it all the way back to 8.2. 
So our treated water has a pH hardness about 110 milligram per liter and then a pH about 9.6. So nine to nine and a half. So if you take St. Louis tap water, go home, take your tap water, take some pH paper. If you want, run up to the lab, I'll give you a piece before you leave, or if you have your own pH electrodes, you can measure and it's about 9.6. And most people think it's like seven or less than seven. Nine point two. And it's because of the chemistry to remove the magnesium and the calcium. All right. You can now pull some things from your water quality report. I read these carefully. I always like it when I get my, I, I don't like it when I get my water bill, but I do like the time when I get my water bill and it comes with the water quality report. And I like to read these. Of course, it's also available online and you can look this up for St. Louis and other cities of interest to you. Um, and there are about 91 different species that water utilities are required to monitor for. And um, they've got about 50 or so organic chemicals, about 25 inorganic metals and some microbial chemicals. And so they'll list what all those are, okay. what the MCL is, which is the maximum contaminant level, that is the official enforceable regulatory standard, and then they'll give you your results. And so this is the St. Louis County water, which is done by Missouri American, which has water treatment plants on the Missouri River and on the Merrimack River. This is neat. I think you can see a couple of things here. So there's atrazine, a triazine herbicide. Chemists in the group, I'll ask you to ask for this, draw me the structure of atrazine. The rest of you don't worry about it, but you have atrazine there. And why is it in our water supply? It's in our water supply because it is a herbicide. It is a very widely used herbicide when growing corn in particular. And we grow a lot of corn in the watershed upstream of St. Louis. Fortunately, by the time we've treated the water, the drinking water standard is 3 micrograms per liter. It's down to 0.2 micrograms per liter. If we didn't treat it, there are certain periods of the year where we would be exceeding the drinking water standard for atrazine. And we do that by using activated carbon. So this is that anthracite, essentially, that you would have ground up to be very fine, uh, very fine grain. You actually put in this powdered activated carbon into the water, let it mix, and then it settles out. And it will carry with it some of the atrazine as well as different species. Missouri River, heavily agricultural watershed. Merrimack, not so much, more wooded. And so we actually don't have the text on atrazine there. So it also even tells us something exactly about uh, that watershed. So that's what activated carbon is looking for. All right. Other things that we worry about in drinking water, you'll look up something called chloramine, HAA5, which are five different haloacetic acids. The halo means it has some type of halogen, like chlorine in it, or iodine, or bromine, and then TTHM total trihalomethanes. These would include things like chloroform, uh, like chloroform, which you inherently, I think, know chloroform isn't good for you. And we can end up with chloroform in our drinking water, not because it was in the source, it wasn't in the Missouri River. It could be formed as part of the drinking water process. So the basic chemistry of that, chlorine, which we use to disinfect water so that people aren't getting sick from cholera and typhoid. Chlorine plus natural organic matter, which is naturally present in the drinking water, and our water supply might have five milligrams per liter or so organic carbon here in St. Louis. In a little bit of time, we can end up with chlorinated organic compounds like haloacetic acid, like chloroform, like bromoform. Okay. We want to minimize these because there is actually for chloramine, or for these guys, there are drinking water standards. That we don't want to exceed 60 microgram per liter or 80 microgram per liter of these chlorinated organic compounds. So, what do we do? We can either get the natural organic matter out. We don't have a whole lot of control over the time because the water goes into the pipe and it takes time to get out to you. We can change the type of chlorine. Okay. So there are two different types of chlorine. We can use free chlorine, which is what you would have in bleach, it's hypochlorous acid and the hypochlorite ion. Wonderful, strong disinfectant, works beautifully, but it has a larger probability of forming chlorinated organic compounds. Or we can use chloramine, which is you take that chlorine, and you combine it with ammonia, so that's the chlor and the amine, so the amine is the ammonia, you make that it's a good disinfectant, not as good as free chlorine, but it forms far lower concentrations of chlorinated organic compounds. So we're going to change the water chemistry so we still disinfect it, but we're not forming chloroform and other things that we're concerned about. All right. Now we'll start moving on to a little bit of the uh, downstream, uh, if you will, consequences of this. Other things that we monitor for in drinking water, copper and lead. Okay. 
Copper and lead are also things that you might find in your tap water, but you would not find in the Missouri River or the Merrimack River, at least not at very high concentrations. So the question is, where did the lead come from? There's very little lead in the Missouri River. Essentially no lead leaving the water treatment plant. But by the time you turned on your faucet, depending upon what city you live in, where you are, you could have lead in your tap water. And it comes from the pipes, the fittings, and the solder, and the distribution system, and in your household plumbing. So how do you control that? You can't remove the lead. What you want to do in those cases are to try to control the chemistry of the water so that the water is not as corrosive towards your pipes and your solder and your fittings. So the same lead is there. You're just not having as much of it go from the plumbing into the water because you've changed the chemistry. Now, something really unfortunate now been solved that relates this issue of the chlorinated organic compounds, those are disinfection byproducts and lead. This happened in Washington, D.C. It may have happened other places, uh, but because it happened in Washington, D.C., we started to look very carefully at it. These are lead concentrations. So this is actually the 90th percentile of lead. Okay, that's how the lead standard is enforced. Uh, a utility goes and they sample a lot of different tap water. The 90th percentile of those cannot exceed 15 micrograms per liter. Washington, D.C. was doing okay, not so okay, a whole lot worse, a whole lot worse for a couple of years, and then it went down again. Okay. This coincided, this increase coincided with their switching their disinfectant from free chlorine, that was the bleach type of chlorine, to chloramine. Okay. They did that because they didn't want as many chlorinated disinfectant byproducts. If you switch from chlorine to chloramine, you will have fewer disinfectant byproducts. Good. For doing something to improve the water quality and protect public health. However, those of you who are chemists here, would, if you're thinking about a disinfectant, and which these are good oxidants, you would be thinking about the oxidation chemistry of this. So these are all the different lead things that you could have. And I won't quiz you now, but this is elemental lead down here. That's lead in the zero oxidation state. Okay. That's a lead pipe. These are all lead in the plus two oxidation state. That's the most common form found. If you have free chlorine, you have PbO2, that is lead in the plus four oxidation state, which is really unusual to find in a natural system. Drinking water distribution system, I would say, is not really natural, but it is in contact with natural waters. So what you have done is gone from a solid through a dissolved species up to another solid species. So the lead pipe, which is the pipe that might connect your house to the water main, was elemental lead. But if you have free chlorine, that elemental lead could be converted over to lead for a solid. That's, that red line tells you where it would be with free chlorine. The blue line shows you where it would be with chloramine. Okay? So with the chloramine, it dropped it from being a solid down into a dissolved compound. This is not good in terms of water quality. You might have solved the disinfection byproduct problem with the chlorine, but you've taken a solid form of lead and started to have it convert over to a dissolved form of lead. So now you see lead concentrations coming out at higher concentrations in people's drinking water. This is some work that we did in our laboratory. That's a lead pipe. We cut a piece of it and we look at a cross section of it. So there's the unaltered lead pipe. This is what we would call a pipe scale. And that's only 10 to 20 micrometers thick. A sheet of paper is about 50 micrometers, 50 to 80 micrometers thick. So pretty thin layer that grows on the lead pipe. And that thin layer has all kinds of little things in it, like lead carbonate and lead fluoroxide. These were things that we were able to make in our laboratory to study this process. So we also did some experiments to look and see, well, how quickly does this lead fluoroxide, this PbO2, dissolve as a function of water chemistry? We're going to look at this at four different pH values, from 5.7 up to 8.5. This is our control. This is dissolution rate of lead in water at these pHs with some inorganic carbon there. And I'll point out that this is a log scale. So if you're new to science, always look at your axes. So this is 10 times as fast as this, other 10 times fast all the way around. Okay. If we add free chlorine, as we would expect, it dissolves less quickly. Okay. So we already kind of knew that. Free chlorine could make the lead four oxide less soluble, and it also makes it dissolve less quickly. If we have a reductant, which is the opposite of an oxidant, 
if we have some reduction in the water, it can make it a lot worse. Because this is a logarithmic scale, this would say that it really made it more than 10 times worse, more than 10 times worse. And so this really exacerbated the problem. It wasn't just that we went from with free chlorine to with monochloramine. If we had natural organic matter, if we had any iodide, if we had any bromide, if we had things in the water, we used iodide in this case for reduction. If we had things in the water that were a reduction, it actually makes the system even worse. So you were essentially going from with free chlorine on up to with a reduction. And that's what happened in Washington. Ultimately, they were able to solve this problem not by going back to free chlorine, but by adding some phosphate. And phosphate helps make the lead, even the lead in the plus two oxidation state, less soluble. They adjusted the pH to an area where the phosphate would work very well, and, and that is how they have solved it. Another thing that a water utility would be doing is um, if they have high lead concentrations in their water, and they're not able to get them down by controlling the chemistry of the water, they need to go out and replace the lead pipe. So as I said, the lead pipe would connect the water main to a house. And in the industry, it's called a service line. It would be called a lead service line. And this is a little bit, you know, it goes very much into the realm of public policy, some things that you would think should be easier, but for whatever reason, they are not. The water utility actually doesn't own that lead pipe. They own half of the lead pipe. Half of the lead pipe is in public domain out here. The other half of the pipe is owned by the owner. And the water utility doesn't have the authority to come and replace all of that. And they certainly don't want to pay to replace all of it. So utilities would come and do what are called partial lead service line replacements. So they would replace this part of the lead pipe but leave this part in place. They would tell the owner, we're coming, we're replacing our portion of the lead service line. For a thousand to two thousand dollars, that would be the going rate. While our equipment's out there, we will also be happy to replace yours. Do you want us to do that? The vast majority of people say no. You replace yours. I don't want to spend. I'm already spending too much on utility bills. I don't want to spend a thousand, two thousand dollars to get this piece of lead pipe out. Okay. So let's see. We take out half of the lead pipe. Does this make the problem? 50% better, the lead half as bad as it was before, is it the same or is it worse? There are reasons why it might be worse, because when a water utility does this, they replace that lead pipe, in most cases, with copper. And because these are people who like to work with metals, they understand the plumbing, brass is a great material for coupling pipes of different types. And so you would have places where you'd have a lead pipe connected to a copper pipe, and coupled together with a brass coupling. They're nice, they're, they don't leak, the people who are doing these know how to work with these materials, except those of you who um, know a little bit of electrochemistry here would say, well, copper and lead are different metals. They are now electrically connected. I have an electrolyte out here. That's a battery. Okay. So there's something called galvanic corrosion, where galvanic corrosion, where the lead becomes a sacrificial anode relative to the copper. So the lead is getting oxidized based on reduction reactions happening on the copper. So putting the lead with the copper could actually make the lead release worse. And there were some big questions about this, so we got involved in this and we did some experiments up here on the first floor of Brower Hall, where we took lead pipe, we took copper tubing, and we connected them with brass fittings, and with plastic fittings. Okay. So the brass fitting is electrically connected, so that copper and the lead are connected. They can act as a battery to have galvanic corrosion. The plastic, that can't happen. These are the lead concentrations down here over time for six different weeks. The lighter colored points are what we saw with plastic coupling. The darker ones are what we saw with the brass coupling. So clearly we had more lead release when we had the brass coupling which allowed galvanic corrosion. The plastic was much, much better, and in fact, it was better than when we had the full lead pipe. So it was really not half as bad, but it was definitely better if we could avoid the galvanic corrosion. Maybe things were getting better with time. We did this for six weeks. If we did this for a year, there's some field studies that would say that it would probably have actually settled down and passivated at that point. Um, but this, I think, should give us some cause for concern. Right. And so the solution then is either get the whole lead pipe out. Use a different type of coupling, 
including a brass coupling with an insulating insert, which is called a dielectric coupling. So you're still using brass, you just have something that breaks up that electrical connection between the lead and the copper pipe. So it is a solvable problem. All right. So I'm going to turn from lead to our second of three elements. Our second element will be arsenic, and our third element will be chromium. So our second element is arsenic. This is a picture, I don't remember if I took this or if I got this from somebody, but um, my own research and my uh, PhD studies was on uranium. And it was mostly about groundwater. Most of my work was done in the laboratory. If I wanted to just have a field site, I had to go to some place that was remote, probably dirty, hard to get access to. But there were people in my research group who were working on arsenic. Okay? And this beautiful stream here is in the eastern Sierra Nevada near Mammoth Mountain, California. And um, there's great skiing up here, beautiful place. One of my lab mates worked here and she said, I'm going sampling next week. I need somebody to come and help me collect samples. I'll go, sign up for that field trip. And so I got to spend a couple of days here sampling the water. This is called Hot Creek, and it's called Hot Creek because it has geothermal input. So that's actually a little geothermal pool there that comes into the creek. The drinking water standard for arsenic in the United States is 10 micrograms per liter. The water in that pool is about 1,000 micrograms per liter. One wouldn't care about this, except that Los Angeles is so thirsty for water that they will go 300, 400 miles north of the city to this area to get water for the city. And they had done that historically. So this small little creek here was the major contributor of arsenic to the Los Angeles water supply. So a, a little bit of uh, the context on it. So the drinking water standard is 10 micrograms per liter. And it's set to protect against arsenic, carcinogenic effects. Now we're interested in arsenic at 10 micrograms per liter. The hot spots on our map of the US show you where the concentrations can be high. There are other places where you can have very high concentrations. Um, principally, any delta that drains the Himalaya ends up having high arsenic concentrations. We've known about this in Bangladesh for a couple of decades now. This is West Bengal, which is just across the border from Bangladesh and India. These areas in here, greater than 50 micrograms per liter uh, arsenic concentration. And these are people who are relying on well water for their drinking water, probably with no water treatment. And again, this is something that you might view as unintended consequences. They could drink the water here out of the, that's the drum of Sutra, I think. Again, this is going to be over there. But they can drink the water right out of here, okay? And they're going to get sick from waterborne. So they drill a well. The water comes up clear, cold. People are not getting sick from waterborne diseases, but they're actually getting arsenic poisoning. Okay. So uh, a major problem there. All right. And so this is some work that we did in collaboration with Sanjeev Chowdhury, who's a professor of environmental engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay, and who also is from West Bengal. So he lives in eastern India, but he's from a western India now, but he's from eastern India originally. And he has a great interest in water treatment technologies that could work to help solve this arsenic problem. So I talked with him about this. I said, well, let's understand this chemistry a little bit more. And then he took these little field units out um, into West Bengal and worked with people to see how well they would work. So in electrocoagulation, we force two iron rods. We apply a direct current between them. We make one of the iron rods get oxidized. We're making it rough. It releases iron. We end up with iron oxide, some little rust colored iron oxide particles, which have high surface areas and a great chemical affinity for binding all kinds of contaminants. So these iron oxide particles, which I've tried to illustrate there as these little uh, rust colored dots, absorb the arsenic. So the arsenic is now not in the water, it's on the particles. So now I can clean the water as long as I can get the particles out. And in India, they would do, do that using something called a candle filter. Gets the particles out, so now we have clean, filtered water at the bottom. Um, I'd like to note that this work was originally sponsored by the International Center for Advanced Renewable Energy and Sustainability here at Washington University, as well as the McDonald Academy Global Energy and Environment Partnership. Um, so some internal sponsorship that we had here that allowed us to build these international collaborations is what we did. So this is what we did in our laboratory. This is what this one liter reactor looks like as it goes through in time. You can see the iron oxide building up. If we look at the, uh, this is concentrations versus time. The arsenic is in the red points here. And so it starts out, we did these experiments at 100 micrograms per liter, comes down. Within 45 minutes, we're at a nice low concentration. We're 
probably below the drinking water standard in 30 to 45 minutes. The iron comes up, that's all total dissolved, total iron, that's mostly particles, dissolved iron as well. We take these out, and these are what the iron oxides look like. That's 100 nanometers. These are very fine needle like particles. So that's what gives it such a high surface area. So very high surface area for a given amount of mass, great removal capacity for us. This is the data from the field trials that uh, Professor Chowdhury was doing in West Bengal. The open bars are the original arsenic concentration. The uh, gray is in the settled water, and then the black is in the settled water after filtering. So you know, I was saying in you know, the United States, we want to get down to 10 micrograms per liter. Some of these water supplies, 500, 700 micrograms per liter of arsenic. Okay. That's high enough levels that you will start to see toxic health effects after just a few years of exposure. Usually with these things, we're interested in chronic exposure. What's your increased risk of cancer if you drink this water for 30 years? In this case, people were having skin diseases from this after just a few years of, of exposure to these concentrations. Um, and this technology really can work. So we drop it down to 100 just in the settled water. If we then filter it, in most cases, we can get down well below even the 10 micrograms per liter standard. A few cases, it didn't work well, and they went back and realized what was happening is that people either weren't aerating the system or they weren't giving it uh, sufficient reaction time. But I would say in probably 14 out of 17 cases, it was a good technology. Ultimately, it hasn't been adopted that much, but iron oxide-based technologies overall are seeing, I think, greater use in India and in other um, deltaic regions like those in Vietnam and Cambodia, which the Mekong also drains the uh, Himalayas and it has high arsenic concentrations in the groundwater there. So iron oxide-based technologies are working. So that was arsenic. Third and final element for us today will be chromium. And um, I love Julia Roberts for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but one of the reasons why I, I like Julia Roberts is that she put chromium-6 in the common lexicon. Hexavalent chromium, chrome-6. And she did it because she played Aaron Brockovich. So really, I love Aaron Brockovich, who, um, if you've seen the movie, great uh, environmental success story, great kind of um, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps story. Uh, taking on industry to protect a population that was exposed to chromium. So chromium comes in two dominant oxidation states. Chromium-3, that's the oxidation state of 3, is in your multivitamin. It is a nutrient. If you fertilize plants, it is in the fertilizer that you give to the plant. You don't want too much of it, like anything, the dose makes the poison. But chromium-3, not very toxic. It's actually a nutrient at most levels. Chromium-6, hexavalent chromium, is toxic. It is a carcinogen. In the United States, we have this uncomfortable um, situation in terms of our regulatory framework where we regulate based on 100 micrograms per liter for chromium. Okay? If that's 100 micrograms per liter chromium-3, there's actually not a problem. If it's 100 micrograms per liter chromium-6, it's actually pretty bad. Okay? So it's not a very good drinking water standard, and the EPA knows that. And so they have started looking at, should we have a standard that is specific for the toxic form of chromium, the chromium-6? Well, July 1st in California, they now have a chromium-6 specific standard of 10 microgram per liter. They have a total chromium standard of 50 microgram per liter, uh, chromium-6 specific down at 10 microgram per liter. Right now, nationally, chromium is what is called um, an unregulated contaminant. So utilities are required to monitor for it, but they don't have to control its content. You can see this map here above 20 micrograms per liter are the black dots. Uh, you know, so anything black and red would be out of compliance, um, and even some of the blue ones in there. So this was a major uh, kind of analysis of existing data that was published uh, about a year ago. Doesn't mean we don't have a problem in Missouri. It just means that at the time this study was done, we didn't have a whole lot of data. Overall, I don't think we're going to be too bad, but uh, you can see there are a lot of places where chromium six could be a, a problem. Norman, Oklahoma. 50 microgram per liter, and it's almost all chromium six. They're going to maybe be the poster child of, of major chromium problems. Okay. So we had learned about electrocoagulation in my group because Professor Chowdhury at IIT Bombay introduced us to this technology. We looked at it with arsenic for him. Well, it's a redox based technology. Removal of chromium, we think, could be really enhanced by redox reaction. So we said, well, let's look at electrocoagulation for removing chromium-6. And now we have National Science Foundation support to do this. And so I'm going to step you through some of this because it just illustrates how we do things in my research group. 
So this is electrocoagulation. There's the iron anode releasing ferrous iron. That ferrous iron, that's iron in the plus two oxidation state, rough is iron in the plus three oxidation state. That iron two is a good reduction to remove the chromium six. So this stuff here, the Cr6, that's what we're trying to get rid of. That's the hexavalent of chromium. But we can reduce it with the iron two. Well, if we aerate the system, some of that iron two reacts with oxygen, which gives us rust. So now we have these little rust particles, iron hydroxide rust particles. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I took away my reactant that was helping me remove the chromium 6. That might be bad. But now I have solids. And solids are good if I'm trying to remove or, uh, something that can uh, stick to solids. So maybe getting solids is good. Well, it can be good because the chromium 6 can actually get reduced on that rust particle faster than it can get reduced by the dissolved iron. So if I have a little bit of dissolved iron 2 and I have a particle, that reduction reaction is faster. And then that chromium 3. To precipitate with some of the iron, almost called a co-precipitate, so it's a mixture of chromium and iron. They're chemically very similar. Chromium three and iron three, they're just uh, they're almost next door neighbors on the periodic table, and very simple. They're the same charge and they're very similar ionic radii, so we can form uh, co-precipitate nicely with them. And we could absorb some of the chromium three and the chromium six onto the surface of these particles. So it can work to remove chromium six, and also I think that chemically it's really interesting. So this is kind of a nice thing to get uh, NSF support for because we know that it removes chromium-6, but we don't know how it does it. Does it do it primarily through this mechanism, primarily through this heterogeneous production, or does it mostly do it through absorption? So that's something that we're now starting to, to tease apart. I'll just illustrate for you some of our results. This is what's happening with the iron. This is at pH 8. Total iron goes up, dissolved iron stays low. That means we're getting a lot of iron oxide particles. The chromium, dissolved chromium, and dissolved chromium-6 are in the red and the black triangle. But they track each other exactly. Within four minutes, we can drop the chromium from 500 micrograms per liter down to less than 5 micrograms per liter. Works really, really well for removal of hexavalent chromium. The total chromium stays the same. That's total dissolved plus suspended. But we're getting it out of water, and we're getting the chromium-6 out of water. So this definitely works. We're now understanding um, how this works. It's affected strongly by pH. I'll point your attention maybe mostly over to this right hand side. So the pH 8 data we just saw is in the green. At four minutes, it's very low. pH 7, it also works quite well. Not quite as fast as pH 4, 5, and 6. Still works, but not quite as fast. And this is because those reaction rates uh, are very pH dependent. In particular, the dissolved iron 2 reaction rate. So we think that at low pH, we're primarily having what's called homogeneous reduction. At the higher pH values, we're having heterogeneous reduction, and it's occurring faster because of that. But overall, it works quite well. It's a promising technology. And our, uh, the way that we work in the group is that we have this idea that if we understand, if we understand all of this, then we can design a system to most effectively and most efficiently remove the chromium set. So this tells us that it works. But if we understand how it works, we can design it and optimize it to make it work as, as well as we possibly can. And that's the, the end of the three stories on uh, toxic metals. Um, I'll thank my research group. Chow is our chromium leader. Um, arsenic work has been done by Lin Wong as well as Wei Wan, who isn't uh, in the department anymore, I was graduated. And then Yin Wong, who is now a professor at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, was our lead guru for the work that we saw. With that, I'll thank you for your time. Be happy to take questions. She has a microphone for you. All right. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, I have one uh, just basic question about the fluoride. It is a big problem in India. And uh, you can see 80% uh, part of the India uh, and people are suffering from the fluorosis types of and other kinds of disease, particularly the children. So um, how do you suggest about the removal of the fluoride and which method can be easily adopted by a common person? Yeah, fluoride removal is really a, a big challenge. I would refer you to Sanjeev Chowdhury at IIT Bombay. I mean, he, that's he works on arsenic, 
but he also spends a lot of his time working on fluoride because it's such a big issue. In the United States, we don't have as many fluoride cases. If you're going to treat it here, so fluoride's a challenge because it's very similar to chloride. And if you know, like sodium chloride, it's very soluble. The fluoride is also very soluble. Things that are soluble are hard to get out of water. Um, in the United States, best practices for fluoride removal would usually be adsorption onto activated alumina. It works. It's not particularly efficient. You have to use a lot of absorbent in order to get the fluoride down. Um, some of these iron-based technologies could work for removing fluoride. I know that uh, Professor Chowdhury has some data on that. One that's a little bit interesting on this because it uh, relates to some challenges of like, where you're working. Phosphate can remove um, fluoride pretty well. Okay? So phosphates are actually pretty good for getting fluoride out of your water. One of the cheapest sources of phosphates that you can find are bones. And so fish bones, bone meal is a good source of phosphate to remove fluoride. Now, especially if you imagine yourself in India, going back to India and telling people, I want you to clean your water up by filtering the water across bones, that's probably a non-starter. Okay. Um, so looking at other phosphate sources might be a way to go. So it will be so kind if you develop something for a common purpose. I had some time heard back about the onion seed. The onion seed is a potential, uh, can be a potential remover, but uh, water become aesthetically not good. Yeah. It creates the smell. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah. this is a very cheap and it can be easily made available to common person. So if you have something to remove the smell, yeah. then it will be I'm much sure. better. You can think about it. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, I had a question about your last segment about the um, excrement foam mm -hmm. removal. So you talked about wanting to um, <clears throat> make that system more efficient, uh, but can you talk a little bit about some of the tests you would do to identify specifically which of those three um, reactions contributed most uh, to removal or uh, changing the excrement foam to trivalent? Sure. sure. The, um the first thing we need to do is use techniques that will be very sensitive to chromium and will give us results that will tell us which form it is in. And um, I haven't gone into it here, but one of those is X-ray absorption spectroscopy, which we uh, work very closely with Jeff Catalano and Earth and Planetary Scientists to do X-ray absorption spectroscopy. It is element specific. We can look at chromium at very low concentrations in solids, and it will tell us the oxidation state. So one of the best things for using this spectroscopic technique, it will definitely tell us the oxidation state. Without question, we'll know if it's chromium 3 or chromium 6. So we'll know if we reduced it or if we just adsorbed it as chromium did. It's also very sensitive to the local environment of the chromium, and so it can tell you the identity and distance and number of nearest neighbors. And so for that, we would be able to tell do we have an iron chromium solid? Because my chromium, the what's surrounding chromium would be a bunch of iron atoms at very similar distances to the chromium one, or is it just a single iron distance which would tell us that we have this? So the extra absorption spectroscopy will be very, very diagnostic for that. And we're actually going to be going um, out to a beamline, as we call it, which is a very bright, intense, focused X-ray source. Four of them in the United States. We'll be going out to California to use one in just a few weeks. So that's one thing that we're doing. Another one we're excited about is that um, chromium has different stable isotopes. 53, 52, and I want to say, I'm not even going to say because 53 and 52 are the big ones. I think 54 is the other one. And those isotopes behave slightly differently in different reactions. And so we have wonderful techniques to look at the ratios of those isotopes. And so looking at seeing how the different isotopes um, go from the dissolved phase onto the solid phases will tell us if it's an absorption process or a reduction process. And so both of those are, I would say, making use of the best, you know, fairly recent advances in uh, technology. So, with dealing with the uh, uh, chlorines that they use in like public swimming pools, is that the same type of water that they use to clean the water that you're talking about? Yes, it is. So, they use chloramine in swimming pools. So that smell that you'll often have is the chloramine, which is a little bit volatile. 
And they actually don't use it at very high concentrations. The concentration that they're targeting is pretty similar to the concentration you would have in a uh, drinking water supply. Uh, I spent a lot of time this summer at a swimming pool. I have a three-year-old and a two-year-old, and that was like what we did every evening after work. And I would always be there when they would come and they would test the water. So I'd ask them, what's the pH? What's the chlorine? And they'd say, oh, it's two and a half. Well, what's your target range? Well, we don't want to be above four, and we don't want to be below two. St. Louis, it's at two and a half. Okay. The challenge for the swimming pool, so your drinking water system, you put it in at the start of the pipe, and it stays there for a day to six days until it gets to you. The swimming pool, that chlorine, there are all kinds of things that it can react with, including you. And so they don't want it to be too high, but they don't want it to be too low. So they're actually monitoring it every hour to add enough, redose it to maintain a nice stable concentration. Any other questions for us? Oh, okay. So once you have the uh, uh, stuff filtered out, whether it's the, the hexavalent chromium or the arsenic. Um, what are you supposed to do with the stuff that's left over? Because it's high in iron, it's high in toxic stuff. What's next? Yeah. Most realistically, you're going to landfill it. So you would like it to be stable so that you could put it into any type of landfill and not just not a hazardous waste landfill. So you would love for it to be stable under a range of conditions that you might see. The big thing on this is you've had a uh, volume reduction. Okay, so you've gone from like millions of gallons of water down to a few you know, cubic meters or something of this iron oxide sludge that you have to deal with. For some materials, you could regenerate them. You could get the chromium off and further reduce the volume. Uh, it's probably not going to make sense economically to do that here. For your lead talk, you talked about using or looking at two types of brass fittings between the, the lead pipe and the, the copper. Um, was the difference between brass one and brass two that one of them had that dielectric you talked about? One of the brass ones. No, it wasn't. But something I maybe should have mentioned on this as we got started, I have to remember which system this is. Duplicate experiments are tremendously important to us in scientific research. Brass 1 and Brass 2 are duplicates of each other. And you'll actually see they don't match each other perfectly. Okay? And um, one of the things that we did in this work, which a lot of people before us hadn't done, um, which we think was worth it, but it was hard, we worked with real old lead pipes. The easiest way to do these experiments is to get a new lead pipe, work with it a little bit, connect it to copper. Okay? It's very reproducible. We had to get lead pipes, that, and they had to be old lead pipes, because nobody put a lead pipe in the ground for water plumbing. They, it, legally, they haven't been able to do it since 1978, and realistically, they haven't done it since like 1935. Okay. So we have 80-year-old lead pipes that the utility went, they dug up, they cut us out a piece of section and sent it to us. So first thing we do is we actually have that steel and do is conditioning. So we take four lead pipes and we try to make them happy feel like they're at home where they had been in the ground, and find four of them that, at least for the conditioning period, look like each other. Then we connect them to the copper. And um, But there are differences on the scales on these pipes. These are two different pipes, probably from the same part of the city. I can't remember if this is Providence, Rhode Island, or Washington, D.C. for this case. But it actually points out an issue that variability is huge, and especially when we're working with these old pipes. We did duplicates. If we could do this work over, we would probably do four replicas. Even three, you do three experiments, sometimes two of them look like each other, and you've got another one that's an outlier. And when you only have three, it's hard to say that the one is really an outlier. So replicates is really important for this. I had a question about this experiment, yeah. too. Um, so with the recirculation reservoir, it's going around and around and around and around, which is going to hopefully just increase lead concentration. And I'm thinking in a, in a home situation, you're going to have single flow so then yeah. you're, you're dropping the blood levels so they go back up and then yeah. how you account for that yeah. no it's, it's an excellent question I've, I've simplified down our approach for you here so we do do a recirculation reservoir and we did this because in a perfect world we would do everything once through 
challenge is we're not in Providence and we're not in Washington, D.C. And so we make up water to simulate theirs, but to make that water, we have to do that. We ran this system on a cycle where we would have one six hour stagnation period every day, because that's actually the regulatory one. So the water is not actually always flowing, it's actually usually stagnant in the pipe. So there's one six hour stagnation period per day and about one 15 hour stagnation period per day, and a few periods of flow. And we would change the water out there once a week. So at the very best, that very first six hour stagnation period of a week was analogous to what you have in a water system, where it was lead free water coming in, sit for six hours, see what comes out. So once a week, you got something that was a really good representation of the field system. Uh, but then the other ones, then we would do this, you know, a cycle for four days, five days a week. We'd stagnate over the weekend with the same thing you do in a school or something. So forth. There were parallel experiments for the Washington, D.C. pipe that were done in Washington, D.C. with this once through mode to get it exactly that way. Um, they were comparable, actually. They were comparable. If we looked at our first six hour one. The Washington, D.C. ones, it was, they were not as well behaved. I don't know if it was a reproducibility thing or the fact that they weren't being checked on as frequently. Uh, any other questions for our speaker? Well, if not, let's go ahead and thank him again. Great talk.